Welcome to One on One with B'nai B'rith International. I'm your host, CEO Dan Mary Ashen. Thank you for spending some time with us. Joining me today is chef and kosher food expert, Paula Scheuer, a French trained pastry chef. Paula has shown her versatility teaching cooking and baking classes all around the world, regularly appearing in media such as the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, and Food 52, and appearing on television programs like NBC Washington, and San Diego Living. She's also the author of several Jewish cookbooks, including The Kosher Baker, and most recently, Healthy Jewish Kitchen, in which she offers fresh, nutrient-dense uh, advice on classic Jewish dishes. In our conversation today, Paula will let us in on some of her go-to recipes during the coronavirus quarantine. We'll also talk about the explosion of interest in traditional Jewish foods, new trends in kosher cuisine, and eating healthier during the coronavirus. Great to have you with us today, Paula. Hi, Dan. Happy to be here from my home in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Well, I'm not too far from you. I'm also in Chevy Chase. I'm in French. Oh. <laughs> so we're, we're close. Um, we could almost have done this from one place or the other. Um, we talked about interest in traditional Jewish foods. Um, has that taken on a, a new uh, interest uh, during the coronavirus? Well, I'll start with challah. You know, so many people, especially people who work, you know, would buy challah from one of the kosher stores, from one of the, you know, bakeries in our area. But what has happened as people were staying home, not wanting to go to grocery stores as often, people needed challah for Shabbat. So people started baking challah. First, they had to overcome the hurdles of securing bread flour and yeast. Personally, I was having trouble getting it, and I ordered from three different sources. It all came the same week, so I've actually been selling challah, to, I mean, selling uh, flour to people in our area to make sure everybody has bread flour to make challah. But people who never made challah before have been posting their challah recipes, and even people who do Shabbat dinner regularly just typically would just buy it because they had so many other things to make. So everyone's making challah. And what else? I mean, people have more time. They're spending more time at home. Uh, perhaps there are some uh, recipes that their mother or grandmother may have given them, uh, something that they've seen perhaps in a, in a restaurant. Um, what other kinds of things are, are people taking an interest in? I would say two. One is babka. Babka is one of my specialties. I have so many versions of babka, both on my website, thekosherbaker.com, and all of my books, except for the Passover one, still have to develop a Passover babka. So a lot of people were posting about babka. I taught a babka workshop. I called it babka variations for the great big Jewish food fest, which took place over 10 days about a week ago. And I think I had 450 people learning how to shape babka lots of different ways. So that has been very popular. I mean, it's basically bread and chocolate put together. So it's the ultimate comfort food, right? And the other one, the most popular searched, you know, baked good during quarantine and lockdown has been banana bread everybody's making banana bread. I am about to get hired by a website to develop variations on banana bread. The first one was made yesterday, which is a sticky toffee banana bread. It's basically sticky toffee pudding with dates and caramel meets traditional banana bread. Test number one was fabulous. So it's sitting in my kitchen right now. Well, during stressful times, uh, many people reach out for comfort foods. I, I happen to like Fig Newtons. <laughs> uh, but comfort foods are, are often foods that lack a su a sufficient nutrition. How can we cook healthier and eat healthier, uh, not only during the time of this quarantine, but uh, after this is behind us? So I'm trained as a pastry chef. My two, my first two cookbooks were The Kosher Baker and The Holiday Kosher Baker. And so for years, I was working on 10 dessert recipes a day to keep up the pace for my work. So... I had to develop a way of eating to kind of balance that out. So in our family, we were eating all natural, healthy food, not using a lot of jarred sauces and you know packaged products to just eat a bit lighter. So what I did in the Healthy Jewish Kitchen Cookbook was literally take Jewish comfort food and lighten it up a little bit to make it healthier. So for example, I take you know my grandmother's stuffed cabbage, which is you know 
totally classic Ashkenazi comfort food. Take out the white rice, put in brown rice, took out the ground beef, put in ground turkey. I have coleslaw in the healthy book that instead of having mayonnaise, has a pureed mango with other ingredients in it. So everything in it is natural. I save my sugar for desserts. I don't put sweeteners in savory foods because I'd rather have you know a cookie than have like a salad dressing drowning in sugar. And it's a kind of way to balance out all of the kind of carb heavy food I've been making and bread making like during lockdown with a lot of lighter food. So it's not as hard as you think. I mean, the ultimate Jewish comfort, comfort food is chicken soup, right? So that we're already starting from something that's healthy. So it's, it's, changing, it's changing your kind of the way you look at ingredients and say, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna put brown sugar in this roast or ketchup and soy sauce and everything. And I'm going to just kind of stay away from that part of the store. As you know, it's been hard to get certain ingredients during this time. A lot of people doing deliveries, not all the things you want show up. So we're kind of left with a lot of pr you know, produce, whatever produce you have, and, and, pro and, and proteins, whether it's eggs or fish if you can get it, and, and meat, and trying to make that the basis of our meals as opposed to you know, heavier foods. What about plant-based? This is, we see plant-based everywhere. Um, and I assume there are a number of new plant-based kosher foods. Um, uh, are, what, what should we think about, about that? Well, I think, you know, like I'm not a person who's ever going to say like, this is how you're supposed to eat. And I can't tell you that like, if you eat the recipes from this cookbook, you'll live longer. But I do find that eating lighter food helps me feel good now. It gives me more energy without having, you know, the rice and the pasta and all the potatoes. So it makes me feel good now. I think that everybody should just try to make their diet more healthful. It's not a leap. It's like little steps. So like when you're planning a meal, make sure there's like a raw vegetable at every meal. It could be salad. It could be cut up vegetables with some kind of a dip. And it's just adding more plant-based food into your diet. You know, I'm used to traveling a lot, going on the road, doing cooking demos for synagogues and JCCs and Chabad all around the world. Now I'm home. I'm also used to going out to restaurants, you know, at least twice a week. So because I'm planning so many meals at home, I'm having to balance out the chicken and the meat with recipes, you know, me meals that are completely vegan. So... I needed to vary my diet just for, you know, just general health and heart health with also having, you know, three adult children and sometimes four in my house who just want to have pasta at every meal, but just trying to balance out, you know, the ribs that they want with some wonderful bean stews that I've created. My, my, one of my favorite stories of this time will always be ordering three bags of dried black beans and what showed up were three bags of black eyed peas. I had never cooked black eyed peas in my life. And I ended up creating a recipe with a kind of a West African influence of a black, a black eyed pea stew in my Instant Pot. And um, it's delicious. We've had it, I think, two, if not three times already. So I've created like new, new regular rotation dishes during this time because that's what I had. No, it's interesting to hear that because I remember reading a, a piece, I think it was in the New York Times early on. Uh, in the uh, in the quarantine uh, era here, about this renewed interest in beans uh, yes. that uh, people have discovered that beans are extremely versatile. Um, they're healthy and mm -hmm. uh, they're, um, they're they can be put into a lot of a lot of different dishes. Are there any other trends uh, beyond the quarantine period? Are there any other trends in kosher foods that we should be looking for? Well, one of them is the Instant Pot. So I got my first Instant Pot maybe three years ago. It's a pressure cooker. Unlike the stovetop pressure cookers from the past, these are extremely safe, super easy electric pressure cookers. I discovered that there was a kosher Facebook group with 8,000 members about three years ago. They have almost 13,000 members now. And I have a kosher, the first official kosher Instant Pot cookbook coming out in February. So I realized it was this huge community of people, whether they work or they already had every burner filled with holiday dishes and needed something else to cook in. But the Instant Pot has just been great, both during quarantine and in general. Um, the other device people are loving are, is the air fryer, just to start with devices and then I'll go into dishes. Um, people want the 
the kind of the crunchiness of fried food, but don't want all that oil seeping into their food. So the air fryer is another cool, cool trend that is as is kind of on an upswing. In terms of dishes, you know, the Israeli food trend is just not going away anytime soon, both in general cuisine and in Jewish cuisine. Those of us who've traveled to Israel, we already knew the pleasures of all the fabulous salads that appear on the table. And so you, we already had all these meals with like healthy food before we got to our meat and our rice and whatever. So Israeli food continues to be huge. And you know, this is the thing about the kosher community and the Jewish community today. We want to eat what everybody else is eating. So as we see Asian food becoming more popular, well, we're going to try, you know, incorporating that. Um, there's more access to spices than there used to be. So you can go online and buy all kinds of spices. So I think that people are, the trends is to just kind of open up your mind a bit more and really look around the world and see what's there and try to incorporate that into our kind of Shabbat table. What advice do you have for someone who hasn't cooked much before, but now has a lot of time on their hands, uh, recognizing that cooking can sometimes be a, an intimidating experience uh, for some people? How would you uh, advise someone on how to get started as a, as a new cook? So the first thing I would tell them to do, you know, I, I've taught... I've taught an introduction to Jewish and American cooking at Camp Ramah in New England for the last 12 years. Sadly, I won't be doing this year, but I'm actually um, creating some summer camps, you know, Zoom summer camp, cooking camps for teenagers, for parents who are trying to keep their kids occupied. So, you know, when I get started with the kids at camp, I, I just try to teach them how to chop, you know, just basics. The most important thing, and because we have more time, is to just slow down. The first, the one mistake everybody makes is that they look at the list of ingredients and, and they get all that and they, then they start looking at the recipe then. Read the entire recipe through. That way you know how much time to plan. That way you know if you have the right equipment and if you, not, if you don't, maybe you need to Google it. Maybe there's an ingredient that there's a quarter of a teaspoon in and you're wondering really if that makes all the difference in the world. And the truth is it, it probably doesn't, you know? You can't take out essential ingredients, but just start with following recipes. I mean, it's really so simple, you know? And, and start with something you love, you know? You don't, the first time you get into the kitchen doesn't have to be when you're making your first pud thai. You know, get in the kitchen and you know, learn how to make basic pasta recipes, learn how to make basic chicken, you know, recipes or roasted fish, recipes that don't take more than some oil and a couple of spices and whatever you have. I'm all about, I like people experimenting, but start with a basic recipe and then you can build from there. You know, make a simple roasted chicken and then the next time you take the same recipe, throw in chopped shallots or even lemon pieces into the roasting pan and then kind of see what flavor you get from that. But really start with things that you like, that you like to eat, and then build from there. And the other thing I tell people is like, learn how to cook vegetables properly. I grew up with, um, you know, vegetables in a can, which is kind of my, my joke about the cover of this book is that it's um, my, my version of modern peas and carrots. It's like roasted carrots with a pea puree. So like either roast vegetables in the oven at 400 degrees for about 20 minutes, or take a pot of boiling water and put a little salt in them and throw in broccoli, cauliflower, string beans, bring the water to a boil, and then cook it for maybe two minutes till it's fork tender and then drain it. And then you could drizzle olive oil and a little salt, lemon zest. Oh, one of my best coronavirus tips is the rule in our family is that you have to zest before you juice because you know we're not wasting any ingredients these days. So. If you're gonna take lemon juice for something, zest the lemon and wrap the lemon in plastic and put that, the zest, put in the fridge, orange, lime, do the same thing. You get more uses out of it. And I, I learned that from my grandmother, you know. Well, now that we're in the kitchen, um, what are the, some of the biggest cooking mistakes that people make that can be avoided? Okay, number one, people overbake things routinely. So my number one tip, if you don't remember anything I've said today, the one thing I want everybody to remember is this. Everybody's oven is a little bit different. If you've traveled, you've rented a house, you've gone to your mother's, your daughter's house, 
you've baked the same recipe that you've made a million times, it comes out a little different. So because, you know, kind of low-end ovens and high-end ovens really do run at different temperatures, 350 is not the same in a Viking as it is in a GE. It just isn't. Three, 350 in a Viking is like 365. So reduce baking time. So the first time you make one of my recipes, anybody else's recipe, if it says bake for an hour, time it for 50 minutes. Check a cake with a kebab skewer, not a toothpick, that only tells you this much about a cake. Really take a skewer and see if there's any, you know, gooeyness on it. And if it needs, you can always add more time. Something for 40 minutes, check it after 30. Cookies for 12 minutes, check them after 10. Because you can add more time. And trust yourself, you know what the challah is supposed to look like, okay? Take cookies out before they're really set because they're gonna continue to harden. Same thing with a meat roast. So reduce baking time and you and trust yourself to know when you need to add a little bit more time. So that's the mistake. People just over bake things. They don't, you have to trust yourself. You've been eating your whole life. You know, you may not be cooking, but you know what the food is supposed to look like. So go in there and like bring that confidence into the kitchen. So we've talked about ingredients, um, whether it's during the coronavirus or not, what should be in, in our spice cabinets? What are the, the ingredients that are a must to have there all the time? Okay, so the ones that I plow through and I end up buying, in my, in my, I would say, you know, obviously salt and pepper, garlic powder, paprika, cumin, turmeric. Turmeric adds color and flavor and anti-inflammatory properties to everything. Um, obviously, I always have cinnamon, you know, and vanilla around for baking. Um, and there are so many great spice mixes these days, like za'atar, you know, or shawarma spice. Like those, all you have to do is shake shawarma spice on top of the chicken and stick it in the oven with some olive oil. That, that's like a, you know, that's dinner right there. Throw some potatoes and some um, cauliflower on that same sheet pan, and you have an entire meal in one pan with one thing to clean. Um, so essentials, garlic, onions, lemon. You know, I don't think I could, I, we keep, you know, that's the one thing that's in every Instacart order is like eggs, onions, potatoes. I have to keep going through those. I almost feel like it's Passover all the time, making sure I have those like, you know, key ingredients. Um, I like shallots a lot. Um, and, I'm just, and I want to share with everybody, my beautiful little plants are here. Okay, you guys see this? So this yep. is how I store my fresh herbs. And I really discovered this during coronavirus because I couldn't always get more parsley all the time. So it's just cold water. And I put what I have here, parsley, cilantro, and dill. And I change the water maybe once a week. And I've been using the stems. I don't waste anything these days because I don't know if I'm going to be able to get more carrots, more whatever. So I peel all the way to the bottom. I can use the bottoms of things to make stock. I did a class, a Zoom class called Quarantine Soup for a bunch of JCCs where it's like the science of soup. You know, where you start, how you build, you can go in this direction, add these spices or that, basically using whatever you have. So I'm due to make one of those soups or make stock because I have some random vegetables that are sitting in my fridge. I'm just gonna throw them with water and onions and you know, peppercorns into a, my Instant Pot and, and I'm going to cook it up and I'll be able to use that stock and other ingredients. It's actually healthier than buying the soup powders or the boxed stock. Well, it's interesting about the uh, spices. I mean, there's one uh, that I have just, uh, we just acquired. Uh, we like everything bagels and uh, discovered there's an everything bagel spice, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, we find, uh, you know, putting into, into salads and into other things to get that uh, to get that flavor of the everything bagel. So oh, yes. uh, there are, yeah, there must be some every week, I guess they're, they're introducing something new. So uh, just before we conclude, um, you've, you've written the, the cookbooks, uh, are, and we've talked about new foods, but are there any dishes that you find yourself falling back on kind of the, um, the old reliables, uh, that you like to cook and that people like to eat? You know, because I have the kids at home, I went back to cooking certain foods that my kids really love. I have a Moroccan spice short rib from my new Passover menu cookbook that they love. Um, you know, they love, I, I have, um, this book has like the babka bites, which are really nice, the kids really like. And by the way, I am now the official seller of the Holiday Kosher Baker, and I'm giving 10% of sales to help feed healthcare workers. So if anybody wants to buy it, they can message me. Um, I also have a, a Facebook group called Kosher Baker 
where other people have been posting their photos and their recipes of all different kinds of Jewish baked goods, and there's a conversation going. So that's been a really fun way for me to communicate with people. Um, you know, as well as Instagram. So I've been posting. So we started this hashtag in our family called Brunch Like a Shoyer. And every Sunday we brunch around the world. And my kids are in, in the kitchen with me, you know, cooking brand new recipes. Last Sunday was Greek. We've done Eastern European, Swiss food, French, Mexican, Spanish tapas. We keep thinking we're going to run out of ideas, but we don't. So yes, I am definitely going back to like making more chicken soup and the ribs that they love. Um, I made my grandmother's noodle kogel for Shavuot. Um, the kids really love that. Um, but it's been such a wonderful time, even for me, to make new things. I've made bialis, English muffins, um, things I never really made. I mean, I made croissant from scratch. It's a fun time to challenge yourself and just, you know, do your research before you get in the kitchen and try new things. I think it's, um, it's brought a lot of joy and uplifted everyone in our family. And in a way, the new recipes have brought comfort in a way that the old recipes do too, because it's a project. We work on it together. And even if you're by yourself in your kitchen, get one of your friends to make the same recipe and you guys can be on FaceTime and make the recipe together. And I find that it builds our community in our home and it will help build community kind of outside of your own kitchen by trying these new recipes. Well, Paul, everyone eats. And so uh, you've just heard uh, some great advice uh, about uh, what to do while you're in the kitchen during the coronavirus. The, the books are, among the books are The Kosher Baker, The Holiday Kosher Baker, and most recently, Healthy Jewish Kitchen by Paula Scheuer. Paula, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks to uh, everyone for tuning in today on One on One with B'nai B'rith International. If you like what you've heard, make sure you never miss a show by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn about our work, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. For my guest, Paula Scheuer, I'm your host, Dan Mariashen. We'll talk to you next time on One on One with B'nai B'rith International.